I want people to be aware that a very important reason to go very low carb or zero carb is because it will allow your body. Annalise, welcome back. Thank you for joining me again. Hi, Dave. It's great to be back. Last interview proved to be extremely popular. So uh, we thought we'd uh, get back together and have a bit more of a informal discussion this time. Last time, we talked a lot about all the, the healing that had happened for you um, on Carnivore. One thing that we kind of, we started talking about, but we didn't really resolve in the interview was uh, Hashimoto's. Could you maybe talk us through a little bit about your Hashimoto's and, and how you eventually got over that? Yeah. So I, I, uh, be- was always I was confused about why I had been having trouble losing weight prior to carnivore and going carnivore and I and I started carnivore um, a little over four years ago so January of 2020 is when I got serious about it and 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 really stuck to it um, sorry that was my cat so and um I went to an integrative holistic physician and she thought perhaps my thyroid was not functioning properly. And so she had me tested for antibodies against the thyroid hormones, thyroid enzymes. And initially we found pretty high levels of these antibodies. And I'm trying, you know, I don't remember the units at the moment, but I know that the, um, the antibodies against thyroid hormone had levels of like uh, 21 initially, which is pretty high. Like they're not supposed to be higher than two to three in whatever the American units for that are. And they, they started to go down on, on strict carnivore and went from 21 sort of down to nine. And then I did uh, a full water fast. And as I mentioned in the last interview, the reason I did the water fast There were two things. One is I'd had a significant tragedy in my life. So my my husband had died and I was kind of in shock and didn't have much appetite. And this was, um, you know, so uh, some years back. And and uh, so I kind of started fasting initially out of grief. And then I thought, well, you know, this is meant to be healthy for me anyway. So I decided to do a 40 day water fast. And by the time I finished that 40 day water fast, the Hashimoto's antibodies had gone down to, you know, just barely above baseline, just barely detectable, which was considered normal. And what's fascinating about that is that according to the internet, you know, WebMD and all these mainstream medical sites, you know, the only thing you can do when you have Hashimoto's um, thyroiditis, which is the full name, is you can take T3, T4, synthetic, they call it thyroidoxine, I think, um, synthetic hormones. And you're supposed to be on those for life, or you can just deal with having a slow metabolism, which means, you know, not being able to eat very much. But, um, you know, what I found is it could be reversed with carnivore and fasting. And I've now kept it completely in remission and have no Hashimoto's antibodies even now. And mostly for the last, say, year year and a half, I've really just been strict carnivore. And the way I do carnivore is uh, mostly steak and ground beef and eggs and butter. I cook the steak and eggs with butter. And then I have a little bit of dairy, um, a little bit of milk in my coffee. but um, And then occasionally some aged cheese like Parmigiano Reggiano or Gruyere. Uh, But I don't um, have the fresher cheeses that have more lactose. So just aged cheeses where the lactose has already been processed by the enzymes in the cheese. Yeah, so that's very significant. Yeah. Um, So that kind of actually incorporates one of the other questions that was asked a lot um, after your last video. Um, And that relates to fasting so was you a lot of people said like why do you fast for so long 
So is that to do with the Hashimoto's um, and you've just continued that or? Yeah, because during the fasting, I had blood work done about, say, 20 days in. And then the Hashimoto's antibodies had dropped quite a bit. Like it was clear they were falling fast during the fast. So on one hand, I, w I had a weight loss goal I was trying to reach with the fasting. And as I said before, you know, the first three days of a fast are difficult because you feel hunger. Even if you've been doing only carnivore, you know, at the time when, and, le and I had been doing carnivore with one meal a day, but when that time when I would normally eat my steak came, came, I was hungry during those first 72 hours. But then, you know, after that, the hunger just goes away completely. So it's to continue the fast is actually not very hard. Um, the only thing that is difficult about it is that eating is fun, right? So you, you kind of, it's less fun not to eat, but I actually wasn't hungry and I, and I didn't feel weak because, you know, as Jason Fung says all the time, you know, even a relatively fit person still is carrying around, you know, something like 40 to 50 days worth of body fat. Um, as long as they have water, right, they can survive on their body fat. And, you know, you'd be amazed how easy that is. And, and if you and most people will do like a two or a three day fast, or at most a week, right. And so they, you know, but but it's so hard those first three days. And really, after that, it's easy. And I think people don't know that. So it's it's, but it, it does extraordinary things for your health to fast. So I think it's, it's really a good thing to do. Um, and I encourage people to kind of work it in. Some people believe in fasting um, like once a year for 21 days. That's probably really smart. You know, an extended fast like that for, you know, 21 days, 30 days, 40 days. Once you get past that, that, say three days of feeling hungry what does that do for like your mental clarity when you're at work and and things like that yeah you know it's funny because i had my own recollection of that time when i was fasting um which was i think it was march 21st to april 29th of last year 2023 and i remembered it as a time when i felt very calm you know like almost like a strange level of calm um like nothing could get to you uh and really you know a strong ability to focus and then also very deep sleep as i mentioned in our last interview and then i asked my my the people in my laboratory right so i have a research lab with um 12 people in it and i asked them like what did you think like, how was my work during that time when I was fasting? And they said, well, you seemed by the towards the end of the fast, you started to seem a little bit slower than normal. So we were starting to get worried. Right. So I was just like talking slower, moving slower. So, you know, um, I think probably the first 32 days, uh, they probably couldn't tell much difference. Um, but then, you know, towards the, after like 32 days, say from 32 to 40 days, you know, I was starting to kind of, um, I think, I think I needed more energy then, you know, but at the same time, so I teach a class, as I mentioned in my last lecture, I teach a class about the human immune system and in particular, um, and I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm a professor of bioengineering at Stanford. And I teach this class about the human immune system. And we do actually have a lecture about fasting. And what is most significant about fasting is that it induces this process. Many will be familiar with autophagy. And they think of autophagy predominantly as your cell kind of cleaning out damaged um, cell parts, what we call, so cells have kind of smaller internal in a way, it's like an internal organ for a cell, but it's called an organelle, right? So they have organelles, like including the mitochondria that produce energy for your cell and many other 
intracellular structures. And what happens is all of those get refined and renewed when you fast through the process of autophagy. But what a lot of people don't also recognize is that at any given time, the human body will be cohabitating with lots and lots of different pathogens. Well, they can be good, you know, they can be commensal organisms, which don't really cause you harm, but they're living in your gut, living on your skin, living in your tissues. And these can be bacterial, fungal, and viral. Okay. So even parasitic. So you can have, you know, parasites as well. And the thing that happens with an extended fast, like the one I did, you know, um, 40 days is not only will you renew all the organelles that compose your cells of every type, but if any of those cells have um, a chronic infection with an intracellular pathogen, which believe it or not is very common that you'll have um, a bacterium such as Staphylococcus aureus, that one likes to go into bone cells and just stay there. And those bacteria that are inside your cells become a reservoir so that if your immune system gets weak, um, you know, the, the infection can emerge from those cells and spread, right? So if you fast periodically, not only are you going to just clean out the cellular structures, but if there's any intracellular infection, you will clear that during the process of autophagy. And this was a 2016 Nobel Prize, actually, understanding this process. So I don't think, and this is kind of one thing I wanted to talk to you about today, which is, you know, kind of a missing piece of the conversation that I hear when I watch um, a lot of the most important carnivore doctors and influencers. So uh, Dr. Chafee, Dr. Baker, um, Dr. Mason, and then the people that love to interview them. There are many, but let's just choose Carrie Mann of Homestead Howe today. So Carrie's been talking a lot um, about how inflammation is really deleterious, you know, and, and the reason to be a carnivore is that it will reduce your inflammation, which is absolutely true. And this is why, you know, do, do, for many people that transition to a carnivore diet, they'll find anxiety and depression lifting very quickly, right? Often within one week to a month, say, right? They'll find their mood just becoming much brighter. And that is because, you know, when you eat carbs, right? You, your, your whole body becomes inflamed, but in particularly your neurological tissue. So your brain, right? You, so if you have sucrose, if you have glucose, literally you'll have inflammation in your brain as a result. And inflammation is one of the disease processes that can lead to anxiety and depression. But what hasn't really been mentioned is how I believe a, a no carb diet, right? You have this great channel name, no carb life. It's also, you know, by, by keeping your insulin levels low pretty much all the time, the way they should be, right? They should be very low. So, so when we have low sugar, we will have low glucose or low insulin. And when we have low insulin, our immune system will be at its strongest. Okay. Now, what happens, let's just think about for a moment, type 2 diabetes, right? As it advances, those people tend to get infections in their feet, right? And, and, and you'll hear people saying that the reason they get infections in their feet is because they have peripheral neuropathy, right? So the nerves in their feet and toes cease to have much feeling. That is true. And that's the sort of chronic neuroinflammation actually will eventually kill those nerves. But they end up having to get their feet amputated. And it's not because of neuropathy. It's because of infection. Right? So as a diabetic, you're much more susceptible to infection. And people that had either type 1 or type 2 diabetes were also much more likely to suffer from severe COVID. Another infection. Uh, okay. Yeah. Wow. 
So, so infection plays a huge role. Yeah. And you know, it's really not, you know, any one of us, if we have like an outright infection where we have say a wound that's infected, we're very aware of it because there's pain. Right. But you know, that what I work on in my research is um, chronic infections of the brain, which relate to chronic infections of the oral cavity, the mouth with um, dental pathogens like Porphyromonas gingivalis and, you know, Fusobacterium nucleatus. So let me just mention that there was just a nature paper a week ago where they showed that colon cancer seems to be driven by an oral pathogen, one of these fusobacteria nucleatum in a particularly particular genetic clade or class of this fusobacterium is in the tumors, all the tumors. And that was true in Japan. There's been a lot of research done in Japan of linking this bacterium to uh, colon cancer. And then it was also true in the United States where they did like a big genetic analysis. So, so I want people to be aware that a very important reason to go very low carb or zero carb is because it will allow your body to clear and eliminate chronic infections of tissue that you have no awareness are infected, right? Your gums. So how, how many times have you heard, Dave, somebody saying, that when they had been carnivore for some months, now their gum inflammation and bleeding went away. Yeah, that's me. You know, that the, the you bleeding too? went away, sensitivity went away, bad breath went away, everything. Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the pathogens that cause gum disease, which is called gingivitis, right? And periodontitis would be the more advanced stage of gum disease where the gums start to detach from the teeth, right? And that's being done because the bacteria that cause the bad breath and bleeding and gum disease, they actually continually released enzymes that detach your gums from your teeth because they want to dig themselves down deeper and get away from oxygen. So they're literally eating your flesh. It sounds so scary. It is scary, you know? And, and, and there's at least seven different types of bacteria that will be in the mouth. And by the age of my age, right, I'm 55, but sort of around 55 to 60, approximately 100% of human beings worldwide will be colonized by a number of these pathogenic bacteria. And what they do is, as I mentioned in my last thing, but I just want people to understand this because you will never be able to vaccinate against all of these pathogens. It's just too many. And you'll never know which ones are really causing the problem for you. So you wouldn't even know what to vaccinate against normally. So going zero carb, going carnivore, essentially reduces insulin, which strengthens your immune system all the way across the board. And now, especially if you incorporate some fasting, will cause your body to clear away those pathogens. Um, and... And it just so happens that these dental pathogens just turn off all of your immune system of your mouth, really your whole body. They just downregulate immunity to make a niche for themselves to live in. But it also turns off your ability to fight viruses um, when you're colonized by those bacteria. And then viruses um, that are able to fuse with neurons then travel through your neurons right into your brain. And that's what ends up over a decade plus slowly causing dementia, right? So I don't think there's any stronger reason, be, you know, obviously it's, it's amazing if you have, if you look better and you can get dates or, you know, you, now your, your smile is better. You, your skin is better. You feel better. All those things are great you lose weight, you just feel more comfortable in your body, but you're also going to be able to keep your cognition and your memory probably for at least a decade longer by going no carb. Right. And that what's, tell me what's a bigger deal. Right. Unbelievable. And it all comes back to controlling your sugar. 
Yeah, yeah, because in kind of like, you know, I saw there's an int very interesting discussion going on right now on Twitter. I saw this yesterday between Dr. Ben Bickman, right, who predominantly studies the hormonal action, especially the action of insulin and ghrelin on fat cells in men versus women, right? And he was saying without insulin, a fat cell cannot grow. So that is Ben Bickman's thesis, right? But Ted Naiman, who's also a scientist who's very brilliant, was kind of disagreeing and saying there are mechanisms by which a fat cell can grow even if you eat only protein and fat. So if you kind of have too much protein, it is possible to get fat. So that, that I don't know who's right, but it's, you know, it's a nice discussion. But one thing is for sure is uh, keeping your insulin as low as possible. Oh, and, and let me just get back to Ted Naiman's argument. Ted Naiman was also saying, if you simply have too much fat, okay, now your, 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 your system will be, your hormonal control system will be to a degree dysregulated simply by having too much fat. And I think that, you know, he makes a strong argument, as does Ben Bickman, that it's very worthwhile to focus on getting to an ideal body mass index for your height, right? You actually, you were, you were never very chubby, not that chubby, but I, you know, I saw your little mm -hmm. video jumping down the stairs. Yeah. You know, and, and it just, isn't it wonderful just to have that, that nice slender fit body and your knees don't hurt and your hips don't hurt. Your back right. doesn't hurt. Yeah. So I, you, couldn't, I, like, you couldn't jump down the stairs before. Oh no, I would have like, uh, I would have, my knee would have buckled underneath me or it would have felt like it would have. And, you know, uh, you mentioned the back pain as well. Like um, I, used to have to hit myself and punch myself in the back all the time because it, it, it was, I was in so much pain standing oh. up, sitting down and it's all just gone. So you had to go through that for like decades of your back hurting. Yeah. My back was like, I remember back in, well, when would it have been? Yeah. 2000. So it was like, it's over two decades. Two decades of back pain. Wow. You know, mm. I find that so encouraging because I did mention to you that my significant other, Brian, fell and, and injured his back very badly. And right now he's suffering from kind of a lot of chronic back pain, but he's only been on carnivore for a couple of months. And I think it is getting better, but it's really encouraging to me to hear that your pain did it go all the way away. Yeah, there's nothing now. It's like, that's amazing. I, I uh, standing up and sitting down, and this is long, long before, you know, I had the arthritis in the leg and all this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, standing up and sitting down, it was just like, you'd go to stand up and it was like, ah, ah, ah. you know, that, that kind of twin, that twinge all the time, you know, and then you'd be walking around smacking yourself in the back so that when you sat down again, it didn't hurt as much. Right, right. And then let me ask you another question. And this is kind of on behalf of Brian. So he has not only back pain from his back injury from falling off a ladder, but he also has what he calls stiffness. Did you have that as well? Like a feeling that your back was stiff or that your hips were stiff? <laughs> so it sounds, it sounds funny, but everything was oh, stiff. Wow. Well, I, I was just everything required a warm up for me. So to me, and, and that brings me to another thing I forgot to mention in my interview. To me, the fact that your whole body felt kind of stiff or stiff and achy, right? That kind of achy when you first started moving, and then you'd have to warm it up and it would be better. To me, that, that I think that's probably oxalate crystal buildup from eating plants. And some of us are probably more sensitive to that, but... I did mention in my last interview that um, while, while I was tr kind of searching for a way to lose weight, um, having watched that documentary, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead, right, um, where he was making green juices, you know, I started juicing and my juice contained um, 
Granny Smith apples, cucumbers, lemons, ginger, and kale, right? Lots of kale. It turns out that kale is a very high oxalate vegetable, right? And, uh, or green. And, you know, I realized after our interview that the plantar fasciitis, which is this terrible foot pain, that only occurred after I'd been juicing for two months and it became absolutely excruciating. And I think that had to be due to oxalate crystal buildup. You know, I, I probably suffered with that for at least a year and a half until I, you know, I stopped juicing. And it, when I stopped juicing, it was mostly out of laziness because, you know, it's a terrible amount of work to make this juice. Thank goodness though, I found carnivore. I mean, I'm, I'm really so grateful. The worst thing about this though, is that, we think we're doing the right thing yeah, and we're poisoning ourselves. Totally. And, and it's not just, it's not just a minor poisoning, you know, where you might take some time off your life. You actually make yourself with all the best intentions of taking the best possible care of your body. Right. And having good longevity. Instead, you you're eating yourself into pain and misery and bad moods two, right? So how many people have had real consequences in their lives, like relationships that they lost, maybe because they were cranky, or relationships that they lost because they gained a lot of weight, right? Or because they were always in pain, and maybe the significant other, you know, just found it tiresome to be with somebody that wasn't spry and fit, you know? And so it really is, kind of almost a reason to feel at least I would say deeply disappointed with the health authorities, because it's funny how they do offer us all kinds of options for ways to eat. If you think about it, like I'm sure you saw on Twitter, um, this woman from the American Diabetes Association, right? Who went, you did a response video. That was very funny. Your, your response video. Um, I forgot her name, but she's, you know, rather a chunky lady. St Stacy. <laughs> Stacy, right? <laughs> Saying, you know, just you can have for one quarter of your plate, you know, healthy carbs like rice or bread or pasta, right? And we're all like, no, don't do that. And, but, but, you know, they never, it's funny, they'll offer you kind of any option, but never, it's like they're totally outraged by the idea of carnivore. What do you think about that? Kind of the real hostility, even among that, mm. normal, what we think of as normal people, they're so hostile to the idea. I, I, I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's probably a lot of things at play. I think one of them is uh, like, there, there's money interests involved, you know, like uh, they they have affiliations with particular companies and like whether it's a spoken agreement or not, um, I think, you know, there, there's only so far they can push the envelope outside of, you know, saying particular foods are bad or not. Um, but other than that, I think there's probably a lot of like if if we if we were to say that these foods aren't good for you then we're going to make people feel bad or we we're, we're going to be going back on advice that we've been giving people for you know 30 40 50 years so what's that going to look like and i think there's all these little considerations about things and it just becomes this big i don't know convoluted monster <laughs> what what are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I've been kind of, sorry my cat is walking around here. Um you know, here's here's what I've been noticing, you know, since as far as I can tell, it is virtually without exception, right, that people when they go zero carb, they feel better and not just a little bit better they feel a lot better and it's often quite fast right um most people are just not aware of this and i think it's just you know this really strong normalcy bias um I, and I do agree with you that there you know at, certainly at some level that would orchestrate 
uh, public relations type stuff and, you know, statements by the head of the ADA, you know, there definitely is money involved because these food companies, you know, are massive. And it turns out that I think it's, it's a relatively small number of food companies and above that agricultural com companies, you know, sort of like Nabisco and um, these other companies. And then above that, we have sort of Cargill, Dow, and all of the, the ones that produce the grains, Syngenta. But then above those, we have, you know, the banks, right? So in the end, I think, yeah, it all, it comes down to money in the end. But um, at the same time, that's what's so beautiful about this. Really, I would say it's really growing into a movement, right? Where people are just talking with each other online they're sharing their personal results on channels like yours and Homestead How and so many others. And, um, and just saying, look, you know, everything that was wrong with me disappeared. Don't, and, and I feel like it's now spreading like wildfire. What's your perception of, you know, how the story's getting out? And do you know carnivore? You still don't know carnivores in Japan, do you? Because they all say, oh, I couldn't do that. I'm Japanese. I, I, I mean, I know a few carnivores oh. in Japan, but they're not Japanese people. Um, yeah, I, I think culturally it's, it's you really, uh, literally and figuratively, you really have to go against the grain. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I think... Uh, I agree. It's great to see how it's spreading. And I, I think one of the reasons it seems to be catching, catching fire the way it is, I, I think is actually related to the way I first came to low carb and, or the way I experienced my first stint with low carb and then going back to a regular diet. And so I did Atkins back in 2000 and the whole time I was doing Atkins, I felt great. I'd never felt better in my life. And, you know, the induction phase of Atkins is pretty close to being carnivore. And um, I stayed on induction the whole time I was on it. And um, that time while I was doing it, everyone was telling me I was doing the wrong thing. Uh -huh. was, no, don't do it. Don't do it. This is bad. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to this. You're going to that. And I was a programmer at the time. The um, the manager of our team, um, he was a programmer now, but he used to be a dietitian. And he was like, yeah, uh, every day there was an opportunity for him to tell me how bad I was going to, you know, end up. And so after a few months, I eventually I gave it away. And I went back to just eating normally. And there was a bit of relief in that at the time. It was like, oh, I can go back to eating whatever I want. But at the back of my mind, there was always this kind of conflict. It's like everyone's telling me I was doing the wrong thing. But I didn't feel like I was doing the wrong thing. I felt better than I ever have. And so I'm now doing what I feel is like in my not in my best interests and it feels like all the advice i was given was not in my best interest and that thought kind of stuck with me and whenever i was in a situation where i felt you know sick or or i needed to do something about my weight or whatever i would always default to going back to low carb or keto and and that's what happened this time as well but i think that's what happens with that that's why this is growing so much is because it might take people a bit of time to get started, but when they do get started, they suddenly realize, okay, I've never felt like this before. There's something in this. Yeah. And I, you know, I have, I, you know, I'm a member of your channel and I enjoy how you have a members only release um, a day or two early. So I, I've been listening to, and I listen to your, all your interviews as they come out and uh, a fellow you talked to who I listened to this morning, I think it, um, that that interview just went public. He was saying, you know, he almost feels like a different person, right? Like mood wise, disposition wise, it is like being a different version of yourself, isn't it? Do you feel that way? 
Yeah, I mean, you go you you go from that person who, I mean, we talked about the moods and stuff before uh, in relationships and whatever. But like, it's the the person who's cranky in the relationship and then gets on the train and is in a bad mood and gets to the office is in a bad mood and like shouts at someone because they they didn't you know complete some little minor piece of work in time or something like that and it's like it's just this snowball of you know crankiness and it just gets momentum and you know yeah you and then you turn that off you turn that that all the problems that are causing that crankiness off and yeah you're a different person you're sleeping right. better um that and that's the thing you you don't even need to do this for two months to get um an improvement you do this for 24 hours and instantly your sleep's going to get better yes and mm. your mood and it's just so the other thing and you've said this several times and i, I always agree with this you know eating in this very simple way beef and eggs right? You know what you're going to eat. You're, you're not going to eat very often because you just don't need to, right? You're not very hungry. And it really is. It just frees up a huge amount of time and energy because you realize once you've switched that you're spending so much less time thinking about food. You know, I, I saw like a tweet for, I, I like on Twitter, you know, I kind of follow uh, the carnivore community and then i follow a lot of people who post their meals just for fun and a lot so and not all of them are carnivores and i notice ladies saying oh it's so hard to figure out what to make for dinner every day i have to come up with something different right so as as the mom in a family right you're you're oh what are we going to have today and it'll be some complex concoction where you have to buy seven or eight different things from the market in order to make it right and of course, it's getting so expensive to eat out these days. You almost don't want to eat out much. So most, I think more of us are probably cooking at home as much as we can just to save money because it's getting ridiculous, the price of food at a restaurant. But it's so easy for us, right? We, we never have to put mental energy into what am I going to eat? You know, we have just this beautiful simplicity. And even that... And by the way, my son, I mentioned, so I have a 12 and a half year old. If you're hearing background noise, that's him walking around. And what's interesting is I, I sort of feel that since I grew up having potato chips and, you know, all the regular carby food, I didn't want to force him to be pure carnivore. So I do have some of the breads, crackers, um, potato chips available for him. I buy them, but you know what? They, they all go stale. The, and I buy him the nicest stuff, but because I feed him steak and eggs every day, he's not hungry. He just doesn't want them, you know? Oh, uh, that's awesome. So can you imagine you have a big, beautiful bag of the most delicious potato chips and he doesn't eat them, even though they're delicious. That, that, that's, that's really cool. Um, wow. And so with that stuff lying around for you too, you're not tempted by that? No, not at all. Because when I see something like potato chips or bread or crackers, I, to me, like, it just looks like poison, right? I mean, I know that it's like, there lies death, you know, <laughs> that's how I think of it. I mean, I really don't want it. That that's a big change that happens when you get to the point where it's like, okay, well, I'm this stuff that's coming in a box or a bag. I'm just done with it now. Done with it. The only thing, um, and I wonder about this, like I have, you know, when you travel, it's, but you know, it can be hard. It can be a, a little bit harder to stay carnivore when you travel. And I, you know, I do, I do kind of like, for instance, in, in, in some parts of Europe, you know, it's less common to eat beef or at least, you know, say in Italy, I love to go to Italy. I speak Italian because I was an exchange student there. They do eat beef, but rarely. 
and they cook it very thin. You know, they cook it well done, very thin, pretty small piece, and they tend to put lemon on it. It tastes good that way too, but for a carnivore, that would be about one, maybe one sixth to one seventh of what we need, right? <laughs> and it's already expensive. So, you know, it, it just makes me think, yeah, and you mostly live on ground beef or mince, right, in Japan, because like steak there is not cheap, right? It, it's not it, it's not cheap um but still even with the higher prices in japan it's going to it'll work out cheaper than eating a regular diet with your you know 25 meals a day plus snacks <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love how your um, your your alternative ego character with the blue wig, right? Um, I did want to mention that, like how the wig goes so beautifully with your eyes. I, I always enjoy that. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just, uh, you know, in order to set my eyes off, I don't think I'll be wearing the the blue wig outside on the street in Japan. Though. Yeah. yeah, that might be a little, you'd look <laughs> like it. You, yeah, it'd be a good anime character, right? But, you know, that that character is always kind of cranky and, and uh, high strung because that's a, a vegan or vegetarian character, your alter ego, right? And, and a lot of that, though, that's kind of, I, I didn't, I didn't put a lot of thought into she has to be angry because or anything like that. <laughs> it was just, I, I felt like that kind of character always being, um, you know, the kind of a little bit ditzy kind of character that's always angry with life, <laughs> even though they're making the wrong decisions about things. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. That was kind of more of the genesis. Yes. Right? Judgmental so you that about really well. When you, right, when you play that character, right, it's always judging everybody. And <laughs> I think that that's another thing about carnivores is you feel sort of, because you feel so much more laid back, um, you tend to be able to just kind of sit back and watch life go by and not feel upset about it, which is good because right now things are, you know, kind of strange worldwide. Well <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. This is the thing that um, I think most relates directly to this laid back feeling, and it's that as a carnivore, I'm quite happy for you know this person to be a vegan, this person to be a vegetarian, and and that kind. Of, I don't care. You're not bothering me. I don't care what you do. Um, and I think that's part of the, the more kind of laid back approach to, you know, whatever, but then I feel there's other people, um, that could be vegan, could be vegetarian or maybe omnivores or whatever. They are much more militant about, you can't eat this way. You shouldn't be eating this way. Yeah. Like this carnivore thing is just the we have to draw a line in the sand you can't go there. And it's like, why do you care so much about what I'm eating? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think they've become convinced that, it, that meat and meat production is going to destroy the earth, which I do not agree with whatsoever because I feel that we've had, you know, large grazing herbivores on this planet for thousands upon thousands of years. Right. I mean, at least, we know that there were these enormous mastodons, like, you know, that humans were hunting 35,000 years ago. And um, there were elk and deer that had like 12 and 14 foot um, antler spans. Enormous herbivores were grazing on this planet for thousands upon thousands of years and longer than that, I'm sure. And the earth was fine. You know, when there was herds of buffalo that made the ground shake in North America, the earth was fine. And when you think about the size of, say, the cattle herd worldwide, I mean, I would bet, I, I actually don't know the numbers, but I, I have to think that 
when the buffalo in North America were at their peak, it was more than the current cattle herd, you know, that we have in in North and South America. And and for now, you know, I'm just very concerned that in a top-down fashion, they're doing everything they can to make life harder for ranchers and to make beef more expensive. They think, and I even have heard, and I'm sure you saw this too, they were talking about like, well, could we create a self-replicating vaccine that would make people allergic to red meat. They were talking about that at the World Economic Forum. So imposing it on us, an allergy to red meat without our consent, that's one idea that they're toying with. You know, to them, anything would be justified because they think that the earth will not survive if we continue to eat beef. I do not believe that is the case. Um, mm. I really, you know, that's my personal belief and I am not in a, a climate scientist or an environmental scientist. I am a chemical engineer by training though. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I can just tell you as a chemical engineer. So my, I have, you know, four year degree from university of Washington in chemical engineering process design and process analysis, process optimization. And then I did a PhD at Berkeley in chemical engineering, you know, sort of higher level systems analysis. Any industry that creates a waste stream is totally possible to clean up that waste stream and deal with it if you choose to, and you, you, if you choose to design the process. What's very beautiful about natural grazing herbivores, you know, the ungulates, I think they're called, the, the animals that eat grass and process it through multiple stomachs, um, like cows, is, you know, their waste actually nourishes and fertilizes the ground and produces healthier soil and, you know, with more nutrients in it. And, you know, you can go look, uh, there, there's a, a famous regenerative farm that, that has cattle and pigs and chickens and sheep called the Polyface Farms. And it's in Virginia in the United States. And if you just search on polyface, uh, P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E, -E, polyface farms, and you just watch some videos from that farmer. He also um, has books. You know, he started um, moving his cattle every day. So he would, you know, kind of have these easily moved fencing boundaries and he would move the cattle every day all around his land. And he quickly found that, you know, the land became just lush and productive. So, you know, it's true that if animals stay on the same piece of ground, they will trample down the grass and, and, and can harm it. But if you let them move like they naturally would, right? Grazing herds migrate, then you'll get the most healthy, rich land and soil possible. And honestly, I, I think once, this, I hope this will turn out to be true, right? Once these ideas spread and people understand that by eating beef and eggs, but it is important, you know, the quality of the beef and the quality of the eggs. I really do believe that's important. And, and, and none of us wants the animals to be treated in an inhumane or cruel way. None of us wants that. I mean, it, it is heart-wrenching the way these kind of factory farms treat the animals. It should That shouldn't be done. Um, but if we start, if we, if, if everybody wanted to eat beef and eggs because they knew they would feel wonderful and live longer if they did that, you know, we could easily take all these millions of acres and regenerate the soil with beautiful herds of, you know, cows. If people want to eat buffalo, maybe we can recreate the buffalo herds. I think buffalo is delicious, you know? Yeah. And, you know, here's here's the the thing, you know, because you you got competing interests. You've got all the you got Kellogg and and all these companies that are telling you to eat cereal and and you need fiber and you need all this kind of thing, right? But you've really only got to give something like carnivore a try for ninety days, and then it's very clear. You don't have to. You can close out 
um, all the marketing messages and everything, and you just say, how does my body feel? Because my body's not going to lie to me, right? There's no marketing messages going on. There's nothing. It's just, how do I feel? And you're going to feel better, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when people realize that they feel better, you know, it, they realize they just, you just shouldn't. I mean, sadly, you know, our authorities, our medical authorities, media, I think the vast majority of people have lost their trust in the, you know, academic, medical and media and political establishments. We've all lost that trust. I, I think even probably the people that are in those systems understand that they shouldn't trust them. Right. And Actually, you know, I know it's upsetting to everybody to feel that way. Like, ugh, you know, I can't believe anything anybody tells me. But let's let's look at one very beautiful thing. And this is really what is great about your channel, right? When, just like your body is not going to lie to you, right? Another person who has no financial interest in what you do, is not going to lie to you because why would they, right? Why would we just regular people not tell the truth to each other? We wouldn't because we have no reason to lie. There's no one's going to pay us, right? And there's something also I think most of us can tell when somebody's disingenuous very quickly. It's kind of an intuitive thing. And that's why I find the stories on your channel so riveting because, you know, we can trust each other. And as a scientist, too, for me, watching all, you know, we said last time, so by now you're probably at 265 interviews, right? Because we talked a few weeks ago. <laughs> is it how yeah. many is it now? Uh, I think it's probably, probably about 290 something now. Wow, you're an amazing hard worker. So 290 interviews is a huge amount of data. And I'm, you know, without exception, it's always the same result. They cure everything. And so, you know, I think that it's going to come down to um, mitochondrial energy, neuroinflammation. And then the piece I want to add to the conversation is that low insulin means that your body clears all the pathogens, all the chronic infection, all the chronic intracellular infection. That's what, um, that's what zero carb and, and, you know, zero carb eaters like us, we naturally fast a good chunk of each day because we're just not hungry. Right. Well, how you, you eat once a day, right? You eat a big meal in the morning. Typically. Uh, so typically fasting 23 hours a day. Wow. So, I mean, and, and that one meal is pretty heavy. <laughs> But um, yeah, uh, it's, yeah. You said uh, it takes you quite a while to eat. You eat a pound of ground beef and, and a couple pound of eggs. Ground or... beef, um, six to ten eggs. Six to ten um, eggs. Wow. Yeah, I have gone back to adding cheese to that as well. So yeah. Were you losing? Did, were you continuing to lose weight when you didn't include cheese? Or no, what, I, I, I've been I've been flat actually putting the cheese back. I think I'm 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 it's pushing Gaining me up a little, little bit. bit. Yeah. So I think I think with with cheese there is a little bit of inflammation. And then um, you also I've heard you mention, and I understand of course, like that you don't exercise a lot, but do you do you walk or like what do you do I, for I, exercise? I walk a lot. Oh okay. yeah. So I'm like for example, yesterday I walked for about an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. And one thing I did not mention is I went through a period of time and I need to get back to it. You know, I, I had hurt my, my heel from sprinting the Sean Omar sprinting and it's all, it still hurts a little bit, but it's almost better. But I went through a period of many, many months, probably at least seven or eight months when I was using an, a stationary bicycle in my house. And I would do like an hour and a half um, of what they call zone two training, you know, where you keep your heart rate kind of in this medium zone. And that is considered 
because I, you know, I had been very chubby before. And one thing about, um, you know, getting rid of the last body fat is that you need to get blood vessels into that tissue. And because you can't carry away the fat, you can't burn the fat if it's not, you know, reachable by blood vessels and blood, the blood vessel network, right? So I think zone two training can be really helpful for those who are trying to slim down after having, you know, lost a lot of weight, because when you do zone two training, you um, expand your blood capillary system and you'll tend, you know, so it's like a fractal system, right? And you'll, you create lots and lots of blood capillaries and those will then, um, another cat is trying to come here now. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, that's an important part of, of optimizing your health, right? It's just getting really good, complete blood circulation. And so, you know, the exercise is an important part of it. But of course, you don't feel like exercising until you've been doing carnivore for a good while and all the joint pain is gone. A lot of the weight is gone. And then now it's fun to walk and run and ride a bike, right? Yeah. Then it's almost like your body compels you to do some exercise. Yeah. But in, in a good way, in a good way. In a good way. You just feel an mm. urge to move and it feels good to move. And, and uh, you know, and in terms of going, oh, I do have a, a couple of questions I want to ask you. So, yes, I will never go back to not eating to, you know, to eating carbs the way I did before. But, you know, can we have a little conversation about, so it sounds to me like you don't cheat at all. You don't no do cheating. It. And it's just because I know myself. And as soon as I cheat, it's just, you know, all just downhill from there. And then I, I've just got that kind of personality. But you're, yeah, but your wife and your daughter, they eat regular Japanese food. Yeah, they just eat regular, regular food. Yeah, um, but uh, I'm not tempted by it. Okay. But I, I can't give into it either. It, it, even if there was a slight temptation, I can't go. Oh yeah, I'll have. I'll, I'll you know, it's a celebration. I'll have a bit of cake or something. I just can't you do don't that. Do it. Okay. Yeah, I don't do that either. But I did mention, as in the in the first interview, you know, I'll have the occasional glass of wine or something like that. But now I'm starting to think. You know, every time I do that, it, it kind of messes me up for, it feels like weeks. So I think I need to really make my full transition to being as strict as you are, as Carrie Mann is, right? Carrie also never cheated. And he ended up deciding to go just beef, salt, and water. And I think, I don't even, I don't even see him eating butter. But, you know, some people include dairy. And I'm just wondering, like, if I removed the last bits of dairy from my diet and the last occasional glass of wine, would it be different? And I think it would. I would say, though, just thinking about it from if I was going to cut those kind of things out, if I was still having them, um, I would be I, I'd be doing it one thing at a time. Like I'd maybe get rid of the wine first or get rid of the butter first or something. I wouldn't get rid of both at the same time because that would just be too way too much pressure. Yeah, maybe the wine first and then kind of see how that affects things. Um and then and then and then uh, you know completely get rid of the milk and the cheese and just just as an experiment, right? To see whether, whether then, you know, if you're really doing like Carrie Mann does, which is just beef and water and salt, you know, would you just lose the last few pounds that you'd like to get rid of? You know, I think you probably would, you know, it's, um, and, and I, I yeah. yeah, I, I mean, I think that's like what um, Dr. Chafee says. It's that last 5% accounts for a really, like, he says last 5% is like the 90% or something, the 95% or something. Oh, okay. I yeah. didn't hear you say that. Now, let me ask you another question. This is a kind of a slightly per more personal question. But, you know, when you lost all the weight, um, 
how long did it take for you to feel like your midsection had really tightened up, like even like all the skin tightening up and everything? Because it's been five uh, years for you. Five years, is that right? Uh, no, no, coming up on two years. Yeah. Oh, coming not even two. that long. So um, I think most of the most of my improvements I really noticed after about three to four months. But when I really, and of course, I'd lost majority of the weight by then as well, but I really noticed the tightening up of my stomach so that when I'm sitting down, like, it doesn't feel like I'm sitting over something anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was probably about five months in. Five yeah. months in. And I think, you know, it's a little bit harder for women, right? I've had three children. And so mm. I'm, I'm curious, like maybe people can put in the comments, like, you know, how long does it take for, for everything to, to tighten up again? But my, now my next experiment and, you know, maybe I can come back in four or five months, something like that, um, is cutting out everything except beef water. I think I'll keep the butter in probably, um, but just beef, butter, salt and water and see whether that really, like Dr. Chafee says, you know, gets you that last um, bit of improvement, Th mm. then you really just feel totally comfortable in your, in your skin, you know, like you, like you would want to be. And you know, that's another thing, like do, doing this for ourselves, like doing no carb for ourselves, it's also a gift to our significant others, you know? Yeah. Because, well, I mean, that's the thing as well is like sometimes you can go, well, I'm paying so much attention to what I'm eating and I'm preparing all this stuff so carefully and whatever. It feels a bit selfish. But the important thing is actually that you can't care for other people. You can't give love to other people unless you're taking care of yourself. Because if you your cup's empty, then you can't, you've got nothing to give to anyone else, right? Exactly. And you need to be able to feel like a, a good version of yourself. Like you, it's, it's important, you know, if you're the best version of yourself and your mood is very um, steady and calm, you know, you definitely can be more pleasant to be around all the time, but you, because you can feel more loving towards yourself, right? Like, Hey, I, you know, I'm not so bad. I'm, you know, then, then you can be a good partner too, you know, and that's, I think that's a really, I haven't heard a lot of people talking about that, but I think it's a really big deal, you know? Definitely. It's, uh, it, I think that's so important, you know, the better you feel about yourself, probably the better you're going to project yourself onto the world and also the better you're just going to treat other people. Including your children, you know, mm. um, so yeah, I remember um, you. You mentioned that now you can kind of play with your daughter more than you used to. Mm. Yeah. Way much more energy for that now. I remember when, you know, when she was maybe you know two or three, and and at that age, they they just want to like dad is the dad is the one who you rough house with, you know, it's like you just get on the floor and mess around and whatever. And, you know, my daughter would be like, you know, let's, let's get all these cushions and let's get all these teddy bears and we're going to throw them around and crawl all <laughs> over them and stuff. And I was just like, you know, when it's her turn to do something, I'm just like lying on the ground, looking at the <laughs> ceiling and just like, oh, let me catch my breath, you know? And yeah, yeah now it's, it's not... now you can run around with her, right? Is she yeah, like yeah. seven now? Yeah, seven years old. You know, okay. like the other day we were racing down the street and like I'd, I'd, I've never felt better just being able to run and, you know, no pain and not oh. not being out of breath. It's great. Yeah, that's just wonderful, wonderful. Mm. Yeah, so then I now, uh, you know, I was, I just want to thank all the people that watched my first interview and there's like 300 and something comments underneath my video and they're wonderful i read them all and thank you and i did also get emails from a number of people who told me their story or just encouraged me to keep talking 
and, you know, kind of not be afraid to put myself out there. And, and I'm going to do that. You know, I was really encouraged because there needs to be balance in this conversation. Right. And I, right mm. now I'm in the minority, I would say of the intelligentsia or academia or whatever you would call professors at Stanford. Right. Um, because not many of them are carnivore. Right. I mean, a lot of people learn from Jordan Peterson, and he's a professor of psychology, um, or he was. I think he might have left the university now. Um, yeah, but, you know, it was interesting, too, that, you know, then I saw him speak about it. And you look at his daughter, Michaela Peterson, right? I watched a recent interview with her like a week ago. Mm. And she's maybe 27 now, you know, and it's just extraordinary that every time I see her, She's more beautiful and she's someone who's super strict carnivore, right? She can really only eat. She said she eats beef strip loin, she calls it. So a beef steak three times a day and water and that's it. She can't have butter, any kind of dairy. I don't even know if she, I think she has salt, but that's it. And, you know, seeing how she just continues to sort of look more and more radiant you know, I mean, it, it's almost like spooky. She looks like an angel compared to most living humans, right? Yeah. And considering she just had a baby, right? And she just had a baby and she just looks so beautiful. And it's, <laughs> it's honestly, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see how over years you can continue to just look more and more healthy and radiant on this diet. Whereas normally we would expect that if we saw somebody three or four years ago, and then we see them again, they're going to look older, they're going to look worse, because they'll be aged, right? The people that are carnivore, it's like they're aging in reverse, and they're getting more beautiful over time. You certainly have. I mean, look at you, you're just glowing. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah it, it does feel like we've kind of... Uh, I don't know. We we've we've found this fountain of youth, or you know, it's, yeah. Uh, anything that gives me my hair back is is a good thing. So. Oh, I don't remember <laughs> you saying that. You actually got hair growing back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, I was surprised. I ended up making a video about it because, uh, like, I had a picture of me when my daughter was maybe one and a half, around that age. Uh, sorry, a video. And I, my wife took the video from behind as I walked out the door with my daughter. And the bald spot was huge. And, um, yeah, it's just not, I mean, it's thinner there, but the bald spot's not there anymore. Wait, you filled in a bald spot? Yeah. I, again, it's, it's, thin, it's thinner, but the hair did grow back. That is amazing. Wow. Yeah. And then I should say, you know, like this is my natural hair color, even though I'm 55 and the vast majority of people my age are already full gray. Mm. You know, people yeah. assume I've colored my hair. I do have a few gray, hair, gray hairs, but it's not many. And I don't seem to be getting them because I went carnivore four years ago before I had any gray hair. And it, I think it really does delay that. Yeah. It's just, it's the way we should have been eating all along. Yeah. And I mean, just, our bodies are like, oh, okay, now we can work properly. Yeah. And now think about this. We were mentioning how, you know, the world is in this very um, tense state, you know, kind of so socioeconomically, politically, there's a lot of turmoil, disagreement. And it just feels like a lot of people are really up in arms about one thing or another, right? Mm. But if carnivore spreads fast enough and everyone gets into our mellow mood state, like maybe that can all just resolve and blow over without us having to have wars, more wars. Yeah, you know what? Uh, and on that point, one of the one of the things that I really enjoy about the carnivore community is like I mean, obviously it's somewhat tribal because we're saying we're carnivores but 
you know, like within carnivore, there's no kind of, there's no fraction and fractionization, fra you know, there's no like, oh, well, you're that kind of carnivore and you're this and you're that tribe. And it's just, we're all carnivores. And, and one thing I would also say, like, um, oh, and I said a funny thing. I didn't, again, I have a tendency to sometimes not finish my thought or my sentence, but um, I mentioned that I had gone on mats, right? And I was sort of meeting a few guys. And when I mentioned Brian that I had picked him, and I said he was the first one that was receptive. What I meant was he was the first one that didn't think it was horrible that I was a carnivore. Ah, really? Yeah. So in the Bay Area, which is super, super um, left leaning generally, right? That they tend to really, um, the media that they listen to and read and watch are the same media that's really saying meat is unhealthy, meat is bad for the earth and bad for your body. And so you should minimize or not eat red meat at all. And so, you know, most of the men I would, you know, strike up a conversation with on match.com, they would just be horrified that I ate red <laughs> meat. Just that that was right there was enough <laughs> reason not to date me. It didn't matter anything else about me. Um, but Brian, wow. you know, Brian actually, you know, I, I, he had that picture of him hunting caribou or, you know, over a caribou and that's how, and so he didn't mind and, and he tried it, but I have to say, I think I probably talked to six or seven different people and he was the first one that didn't think it was horrible. So it's kind of a little bit depends on what area of the country you live in. In the Bay Area, it's harder to be carnivore, the Bay Area of California where I live. Mm -hmm. And of course, just like for you, you're you said you know a few carnivores in Japan, but they're not Japanese, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's just not going to that that's just not going to be a thing for a long time in Japan, I think, because culture is just too strong here. I think yeah. it's probably pretty much the same in in South Korea as well. The culture right. is just so strong. Yeah, and and you know, generally the Japanese and the South Koreans have been pretty healthy on the diet, their national cultural diets. Mm. But, you know, what's caused problems more recently is more of the packaged and processed foods partly influenced by the West, but also coming from there, right? So yeah, I, this is another thing I wanted to say because I am a sort of card carrying chemical engineer, two degrees in chemical engineering, right? Also bioengineering. You know, I just feel like the entire processed food industry and in many ways, even industrialized agriculture, which has created these chemicals like glyphosate and many other pesticides, herbicides, you know, those were all created and propagated and scaled up massively by chemical engineers. And I, I think there's penance to be done by chemical and biological engineers for having done this to our food supply. Because one thing, um, you know, another person who's sort of a, a thought leader on Twitter, um, Scott Adams, he recently mentioned that as soon as he cut only bread, he just cut bread out of his diet all his joint pain went away. He still eats some mm. other things that are, you know, we don't consider carnivore, but mm. just getting rid of bread was enough to get rid of all of his pain. Mm. And he's been spreading that message. And what he's saying now is somehow our food supply seems to be poisonous. Mm. It seems to be, doesn't it? Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's designed to get us addicted and, who cares about the consequences because I'm not going to be president of this um, food manufacturing company by the time all this comes to fruition. Right. It's, right. Yeah. And well, the other thing I'm going to mention is that what people might not understand is that in the United States, our regulatory agencies are essentially captured and controlled by the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. And, you know, that is definitely true in the food industry. So there are many, many chemical additives that are allowed in the United States in processed foods that are not allowed in Europe. I'm not sure about Asia, 
But at least in Europe, they're very strict with what they allow into their food supply. And I would say if you go to Europe and you look at the people in, you know, Northern Europe, in the Italians, like they are not obese and pasty and sick looking the way Americans are. And I, so I think it's, there's really some truth to this idea that that our food supply, if you eat processed foods and grains, there really are. And if maybe even just eating vegetables and fruits, you know, um, we, we see that food prices are going up and up. So people are tending to be less willing to buy organic because that costs even more, right? And so the poisoning is worse on non-organic foods. Yeah. So, yeah, effectively, um, you know, ultra processed food is is worse in America than it w would be in, say, Europe or maybe Australia or someone like that. Yeah, you know, I think it's really bad in all of North America. So the America, the United States of America, and Canada, mm -hmm. right? All of those areas have this, um, you know, what they call regulatory capture, right? Where the the regulated industries control the regulators in the, in the United States. And it's interesting because I think food is actually much also much healthier in Mexico as well. I'm not, you know, because I think if you go down there again, you see people looking healthier in Mexico than they do in the United States quite often. Um, and so this needs to be reversed. This needs to be changed. Uh, and the thing about this is, though, that's not going to change from the top. This is another thing that needs to be uh, like grassroots from the bottom because no one's going to do it for us, right? Well, I would say it definitely needs to be grassroots no matter what. And that's kind of, you know, where the organic food movement came from. But, you know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is actually speaking about these things explicitly. So, I, you know, I don't know as a third party candidate if he has a real chance to win, but if he did, he would be working from the top to address these, these issues. He's, he's actually someone that's aware of them. Um, but, you know, in, what we can do right now is all of us just regular people, right? We can help each other with channels like yours where we share our stories and just understand that, especially in America, it's just much healthier and safer not to eat plants and grains, sadly, sadly, because we all think they taste wonderful, you know? Like I have very fond memories of cakes and pies and cookies and homemade breads and all that, you know? I grew up baking wonderful treats. Um, so I guess I'm glad I got to do that, but no more. Unless... Thank you so much for coming back on. And um, I hope you will come back on in um, a few months after you've, uh, you know, restricted the diet a little bit more just to see how things are going. Yeah. So, you know, you'll, I presume that when I come back in four or five, six months, whenever I feel like I've completed that process, you'll be able to see the difference in my face, you know, and hopefully I'll get down from 132 where I'm at now. You know, I started just, just to, for people that might not have seen my first interview, you know, I started at 197 and I got down to 132. Um, so 65 pounds lost just doing um, beef, at, beef and eggs and butter um, with a little bit of milk in my coffee. And now I want to get down to 107, which would be perfect for my height. And I'm also going to be interested to see whether completely giving up alcohol and the, the last bit of dairy will have further effects on my mood and my health. Um, and I expect it will. So I want to say, Dave, you are an inspiration to me because you completely got rid of the alcohol and you're, you don't cheat at all. And that's really impressive. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you saying that and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come back on and and talk to us it's extremely insightful okay thank you and you can put my gmail in the pin comment again and um, people can feel free to send me an email if they just want to comment or talk about anything